Well, good morning, dear brothers and sisters. I couldn't believe a moment ago when Kevin said this is our seventh live stream service. It's, it's hard to believe. Um, but, you know, every week brings us closer to seeing Christ face to face. Isn't that good news? And we can always think about that. Also, just consider in redemptive history how much God has put himself under great disadvantages and then overcome them. He consistently does this. He did it by confusing the languages at the Tower of Babel, knowing what difficulty it would make for the spread of the gospel, and overcame it by the gift of tongues, the ability to speak languages without studying them at all, and then the gift of diligence on the part of missionaries to learn languages. Think about how it was better for God to speak to the Israelites directly by his own voice at Mount Sinai. It was a step down for him to commit that speaking ministry to Moses, and then a step down from there to not get Moses, but to read what he wrote, and yet God overcomes all of these disadvantages again and again. Think about the Apostle Paul. He enchained him, uh, this great church-planting missionary. He enchained him, and yet at the end of his life, Paul wrote 2 Timothy 2.9, God's word is not chained. And one other thing is prayer, and I get a chance to pray now, as Kevin just did. And when we pray, we should always be mindful of the fact that our mediator is constantly at the right hand of God and always lives to intercede for us. And how it says in Romans 8 that the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with the will of God. We are already thoroughly prayed for, but now we can join the Son and the Spirit in praying to the Father for one another. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have to gather electronically. Uh, Lord, we know it's not the same, it's not as good, but we also know, as I just said, that you consistently put your work under disadvantages and then overcome them by your sovereign grace. And so we're grateful for that, Lord. We're grateful for another week closer to heaven, another week closer to being uh, with you face to face, and as we trust, another week closer to being able to fellowship physically with one another here at the church. We look forward to that. In the meantime, Lord, we join you in praying for the work of God around the world. We pray, as you did, Lord, in the great high priestly prayer, that we would be kept safe from Satan's attacks, that we would be made one as the Father and the Son are one, that we would be sanctified by the truth, set apart from sin and from wickedness and darkness by the ministry of the word. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would prepare us, as Kevin just prayed, prepare us uh, to share the gospel as you give us opportunities. We can do some of that electronically with lost people now through emails, phone calls, other things. But Lord, we know uh, soon we believe that we will be able to have normal life again at work or in the marketplace in different places of life. And that we yearn, O oh Lord, we yearn to share the gospel of life as we're in a world of death, a, a dying world, a world of disease and suffering and sorrow. Uh, we know that there is only one light in this dark world, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So give us, O oh Lord, the courage, give us words uh, to say, help us to be mindful of our brothers and sisters, mindful of those that are suffering in our midst, not just from COVID-19, but there are all kinds of other things, some of them related, like economic difficulties, some of them completely unrelated to the virus. But Lord, we know that you are working in all things to, to uh, cause all things to work together for good for those who are called according to your purpose. So help us to be faithful in praying for one another in this local church, to pray for the elderly uh, who are more vulnerable, uh, to pray for those whose jobs have been threatened, uh, to pray uh, for the leaders of our church, for the elders as we meet tomorrow evening to discuss uh, wise steps toward uh, reassembling whenever we get a chance to do that. Lord, just be with us in all things. And now we need you to unfold the word of God. The word of God will, will be meaningless to us. It will not have any impact on us at all, even the perfect word of God, apart from the ministry of your Holy Spirit. So be with me as I speak and all of us as we meditate and study together, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to ask that you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13, and we're going to begin this next phase of our walk through this incredible book, 1 Corinthians. As we get to this chapter, I would say perhaps one of the most famous chapters in all the Bible. I have the privilege again and again of officiating weddings, and I would say probably two-thirds of the weddings I've officiated, this has been one of the scriptures that people have chosen to read. And it's, and it's right uh, to do that so we can celebrate Christian love at a Christian uh, wedding, a Christian marriage. Uh, and yet, these words long time ago ceased to be sweet wedding poetry for me. Um, there is a, a toughness to 1 Corinthians 13. Once you start meditating on this definition, this comprehensive definition of what love is and what love isn't, how it affects us uh, and what will happen if we don't have it. It is a very strong chapter. To some degree, you feel, you know that expression like we're being put through the ringer. 
Um, I think about that, uh, I think over a century ago, my grandmother used one of those old style washing machines. You can picture a big kind of tub with sudsy water and you're taking the dirty garment and putting it in there and, and you're racking it and, and rubbing it on this rack and pulling it up and it's dripping and you're rubbing it some more. And then you put it through the wringer as it squeegees out all of this dirty water and you look at it and it needs to be washed again. And so it is, I feel like we go carefully, step by step, through 1 Corinthians 13. We feel like we're being put through the ringer. And I think we need to have uh, not too light a view or too heavy a view of this chapter. And so week after week, I'm I'm going to want to go both sides. I want this chapter to have its way with us. I want it to work us over. I'm going to make an argument in the weeks that we have to study this chapter that this is a, a pure distillation of the law of God horizontally, one to another, the second great commandment. And as law, it's going to work us over. Uh, It's not here to tell us how wonderful we are and how how incredible we are and how good at loving. It's to show us our faults and our flaws and our deficiencies. So we can't have too light a view of it as a a kind of fluffy wedding poetry, but we can't be crushed by it either. It ends up, 1 Corinthians 13 ends up in heaven. It ends up with, with heavenly love. And we someday, brothers and sisters, through the ministry of the gospel and through the transformation of glorification, we are going to be perfected in love. So we, want, we don't want to be crushed by it either. We want to have a serious walk through this chapter and find ways that we need to grow and develop in love, but we also need to be filled with hope. And so to that end, let's look at the heaviness of this chapter and let's try to understand. And as I, and I, as I look at it, I feel like this chapter is designed to put sin to death in our lives, that we would mortify lovelessness in our lives. It's designed to kill us that it may give us life. Uh, Jesus said that the Christian life really is a life of learning how to die. He said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So there is a daily dying to self. And this chapter, which defines perfect horizontal love toward other people, it commands me to die to myself constantly. I've said many times before that we sinners from birth, from infancy, have a fanatical commitment to self. Uh, Recently, my daughter Jenny and her husband Stephen gave birth to our first grandchild, Sola, Sola Grace, uh, named after by Grace alone. What a wonderful name. And she's a sweet baby. She's, um, she's, it seemed relatively easy uh, to care for and has a sweet disposition. But she is, like all babies, fanatically committed to self. And her mom and dad know this, uh, that very much uh, she is going to get her own way or, or want her own way and demand it, and it's going to get more and more. So it is with all children. We have been that way from infancy. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 is a powerful remedy to that relentless bent of the flesh toward selfishness, toward feeding of the self. If you look at the 15 statements that Paul makes about what love is and what love isn't, uh, you realize the flesh is opposed to all of them. The flesh is impatient. The flesh is unkind and jealous. The flesh is boastful and arrogant and rude. The flesh most definitely seeks its own pleasure relentlessly. The flesh is easily provoked. The flesh definitely keeps a record of wrongs done to it. The flesh does not delight in the truth, but rejoices in evil. The flesh bears nothing. It believes the worst about other people. It has no hope in the relationship and gives up on other people quickly. That's what the flesh does. Every single one of the 15 assertions that Paul makes about love uh, calls us to a kind of death, to spiritual warfare, that we would put the flesh to death. Now, the good news of the gospel, as I've said, is that God knows that we can never produce or manufacture this kind of supernatural love on our own. Our salvation is a work of grace from the beginning to the end. It is the very thing the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ are brought into the world and into our lives to produce, that we would become supernaturally loving people. This is the work the Spirit wants to do in us. So for a number of weeks, we are going to be walking through this chapter. We're going to slow down. We're not going to hurry through it. Uh, Already I've written, I think, four more sermons on this, and I'm not even beyond verse 7, I think, or 6, something like that. So we're going to take our time, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit do its work on us in reference to love. Now, other than the Holy Spirit and our dear friend, the Apostle Paul, 
Uh, one of my guides through these sermons will be Jonathan Edwards, a great Puritan, New England Puritan pastor from the 18th century who preached, now get this, 16 sermons through these 13 verses uh, in the year 1738. The revival at Northampton, Mass, had already happened a few years before that. The first great awakening was still a few years off, and so in between, he preached this series of sermons uh, to exhort the church to a life of daily love with one another. And it's a a marvelous work, detailed work. I'm not going to preach, I don't think, 16 sermons and 13 verses, but I'm going to lean heavily. Uh, These sermons were gathered in a volume called Charity and Its Fruits, and I would commend it to you. You can read it online. It's public domain, and I'll be leaning on his insights again and again. Now, I want to begin by saying that love is the supreme goal of our salvation. This is what our salvation is meant to do, to make us love. Edwards put it this way, all the virtues that are saving and that distinguishes true Christians from others are summed up in Christian love. He also says, notice what excellent things are being mentioned as worthless without love. The most excellent things that have ever belonged to natural man. The most excellent privileges and the most excellent performances are nothing without love. So things such as speaking in tongues, prophesying, fathoming the deepest mysteries of the Christian faith, possessing all true knowledge, laying down one's life as a martyr, giving everything that one possesses to the poor and needy. These are some of the greatest privileges and some of the greatest performances there could ever be on earth. And Paul says all of them are worthless without love. If even these most excellent things, privileges and performances, are worthless without love, then love must truly be the sum and substance of our Christian religion. And I think it is. Now, I think if we look at the two great commandments that Jesus gave, he was asked, what are the greatest commandments of the law, or which is the greatest commandment in the law? Matthew 22, 36 through 40, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So therefore, love really is the sum of what God is working in us by his grace. Paul makes a similar assertion in Romans 13, verse 8 through 10. He who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So everything that Christian salvation works in the soul is ultimately summed up in this one word, love. Now, love vertically for God above all else, that we would love God more than any creature, above all things that we would love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. But 1 Corinthians 13 is not primarily, or first and foremost, about vertical love, love for God. It is definitely about horizontal love that we should have for one another. Now, what do we mean by love? We use this word all the time, don't we? Uh, It's remarkable how the same four-letter word, the same English word for love is used for such a wide uh, range of experiences, like, I love my wife, I love our dog, I love my new suit, I love going to the beach, I love seafood, I love college football, I love chocolate chip ice cream, I love Jesus Christ. Now, if any of you know me, you know that that list does not entirely refer to me. But we use those expressions uh, for everyday life experience. The same word. Really, I love chocolate chip ice cream, and I love Jesus Christ who died for me. We use the same word. Now, the Greeks had different words for love. For example, sexual love, eros. Uh, Family affection or natural affection, like a parent would have, a mother would have for her uh, infant, storge brotherly affection that we would have for friends, philia, and then a morally pure self-denying love, agape, which is the focus here. Sometimes those words are used interchangeably in various verses, but those are different aspects of of love. But we, in English, we just have this this one word, love. Now, Jonathan Edwards defined love in this way. That by which, love is that by which something is dear or precious to another. 
that, that by which something is dear or precious. But he goes into much greater detail in another great work he wrote, which is Treatise on Religious Affections. And in Treatise on Religious Affections, he said that the human heart has a twin ability, a capacity, first, to understand something in terms of its, its nature and its behaviors, et cetera. That's more of a scientific knowledge and evaluation of something. And then secondly, to be attracted to or repulsed from that thing to a greater or less degree. So attraction would be that by which we use the word like or liking or love, and then repulsion by which we use the word disliking even to hatred. In, in my own heart, I've, I've had a sense of a number line of affections with zero being uh, perfect indifference and then the positive being liking on into loving and then the negative being disliking on into hating. We, we do this all the time. And so therefore, I tend to think of it as the heart's capacity to be attracted like a magnet or conversely to be repulsed. But we're talking about positively love, that our heart is attracted, that by which something or someone is dear to us or we're drawn to it. Now, when it applied to human beings, as in this chapter, it has to do with a heart disposition, affections toward other people. Now, what you love and what you hate ultimately define you as a person. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9, it speaks of the father's love for the son and why he loves him and esteems him so highly. In Hebrews 1, 9, it says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. That's the father's commendation of the son. Dear son, my son whom I love, it's because you love righteousness and hate wickedness that you are the greatest of all human beings. It defines you as a person, what you love and what you hate. Now let's take this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, and set it in context. We are walking through 1 Corinthians, been doing that for a long time now. Took a break, but now we've come back to it. And we're in the middle of a section in which Paul is writing to this sadly very, very talented, gifted church, but dysfunctional in so many ways. He's writing them, 1 Corinthians 12, 1, about spiritual gifts, special abilities that God gives through the Holy Spirit to build up the body, special abilities uh, like speaking in tongues, prophecy, giving, uh, administration, special abilities. So we've got three chapters on this, 1 Corinthians 12, um, 13, and 14. Now, the Corinthians were fractious and divided and prideful and arrogant, and some of them were very boastful about their spiritual gifts. They thought very highly of themselves. They really effectively could say to others, I don't need you. Like, my gifts are so great, I don't have any need for you. And others were kind of buying into that and feeling very crushed by the whole thing and were saying, you don't need me. And so Paul gives this beautiful image in 1 Corinthians 12 of the body with many members, and the members are all working together. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ. And so he is working on this arrogant attitude or this crushed attitude that you would not think either too highly or too lowly of your gifts. And as he gets to 1 Corinthians 13, he's looking at the heart attitude you have toward your brothers and sisters, toward other people while you use your gift. This is vital that they would use their gifts in love for one another. So he introduces this love chapter at the end of chapter 12, verse 31, with these wonderful words. I will now show you the most excellent way. So this is the most excellent way that you should use your gifts, and that is love. Now he begins with the gift of tongues. Tongues without love, he says, is empty noise. Look at verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So I think the Corinthians, those that had the gift of tongues, were very proud of that gift. It was, it was a supernatural gift. It elevated them, like in their pagan days, the frenzy and like the Oracle of Delphi and all that, to be touched by the divine or the supernatural and be able to speak in tongues. It elevated. They were very arrogant, very proud of their gift. So Paul shows them how vital love is compared to the gift of tongues. And he uses extreme language, really, in all three of these verses. If I take the gift and push it to its extreme and I don't have love, it's really worthless, ultimately. So he uses the word if, 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 if. Uh, kind of like this. Even though I were to have the gift of tongues up to the nth degree, the tongues of men and of angels, even if I had the most excellent speaking gift ever, 
Um, so he zeroes in on the tongue of men and of angels, whatever that could be. What are the tongues of angels? Just We could imagine eloquence, the ability to just move people with our language and to be able to speak languages immediately and, and with, with a, a flourish, just a gift of communication. Preachers in particular, I think, are known and celebrated often for their eloquence. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople, lived uh, from 347 to 407. His name literally means golden mouth. Wouldn't you love to be called the golden mouth? Like you can just speak and people melt. Just amazing. Or John Bunyan, who is a tinker that is a repairer of pots and pans and sharper, sharpener of knives. Very much a blue collar guy, not, not ed- educated, but he had an amazing gift of language. He was an incredible preacher. And we see his gift of language, of course, in in, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. But he was an amazing preacher. And John Owen, the great Puritan theologian, loved to go hear him preach. Well, John Owen was an aristocrat, very well known, and a friend of the king. And the king said to him, why do you go hear that that, that tinker prattle? He was very disdainful of Bunyan because he's he's a low-class, lower-class person. And Owen said, may it please your majesty, if I could possess that tinker's abilities to move men by words, I would surrender immediately all of my learning. Just his ability to move people by eloquence. George Whitfield, perhaps one of the most eloquent, passionate preachers of the gospel in church history, had an amazing gift of eloquence. Uh, so much so that an actor named Garrick said these words, heard him preach and said, He could move, Whitfield could move men to tears by simply pronouncing the word Mesopotamia. It's like, wow, I mean, to have the ability to melt people by saying Mesopotamia. Charles Spurgeon was known as the Prince of Preachers, probably one of the most eloquent uh, speakers of the English language ever. He went up without any notes at all, and just, all you have to do is read a Spurgeon sermon and say, how could this level of eloquence flow through anyone's mind. But he said this about eloquence. Let eloquence be flung to the dogs rather than souls be lost. What we want is to win souls. They're not won by flowery speeches. So eloquence, the the tongues of men and of angels, highly esteemed among human beings. But Spurgeon's right. Souls are not saved by eloquence. They're saved by the Spirit of God, mediated through people who really care about other people who deeply love other people, who are shattered by the spiritual lostness and the condition of other people. Robert Murray McChain was one such man. He ministered in the first half of the 19th century. He moved thousands in Scotland to faith in Christ and died young, very young. But it was not his eloquence that saved souls. I read an account once of a young pastor that went to the site where McChain had ministered years and years later. And he, he didn't see the spiritual power in his own ministry and wanted to connect with whatever it was that was happening in McShane's ministry. And there was an old man there who actually had heard McShane preach. And he was the caretaker at uh, McShane's church. Um, and this young pastor went and he said, tell me, what is the secret of the amazing influence of Robert Murray McShane? And the old man took the young pastor inside the church into McShane's study. He said, sit down here at the desk. Now put your elbows left and right here. Prop your face up on it and weep. Weep. Weep for the people you're about to talk to. Weep for those who will hear you. Weep for their souls. Then get up and preach. So as I look at that, it's like my heart has to be knit together with the work that God is doing through the words. It's not enough to have the tongues of men and of angels if there's no heart of love for other people. Tongues without love is worthless Paul said, I would be a tinkling brass or a clanging gong if I had no love. So you you can picture that. I've been near Buddhist temples. I was near one in uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. And there's all these little tinkling things like wind chimes everywhere. Um, You could picture that. And and the same thing in Shinto shrines in Japan. There's these these gongs and there's just nothing. It's meaningless, just empty noise. Maybe for in our culture, you you know those little wind-up monkeys that have those little little symbols go kink, 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 like that. So that's, you can picture, it's just what truth, what power is coming from that? None. It's just empty noise. 
Tongues that do not flow from love are worthless. So imagine then, let's make it very practical, someone getting up in front of the Corinthian congregation filled with pride, filled with self-focus, filled with self-love, speaking in tongues better than anyone ever has before. He has no love for the congregation at all. The only thing he wants from the congregation is praise and commendation back for himself. Completely selfish, Paul's saying that whole display is worthless. Worthless. It's a wind chime at a time it achieves nothing of eternal significance. Then he goes from tongues to prophecy and knowledge. Prophecy and knowledge without love are nothing. Look at verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. Now Paul will argue in the next chapter that prophecy is the greatest, the most impactful of all spiritual gifts. Prophecy is the ability to speak the word of God directly by revelation from God through the prophet to the people so that the prophet can say, thus says the Lord and out comes the word of God. Though the Corinthians greatly esteem tongues, Paul will want them, he'll argue in chapter 14 that they should yearn even more and esteem even more the gift of prophecy because of the impact it has on people's hearts. 1 Corinthians 14 24 and 25, it says, if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. That's the impact of prophecy used by the power of the Holy Spirit. But what Paul's saying here in chapter 13 is that pro- the prophet who has no love is nothing. Now certainly, a genuine prophecy from God, the words can have impact even if the prophet himself is a worthless man. We know this, for example, Balaam. Balaam spoke true prophecies about Jesus centuries out. I see him but not near. A star will arise in Jacob. The words were true, but Balaam was worthless. He was a worthless man. Though he spoke true prophecies, he, he led Israel into sin with Moabite women and was slaughtered as a result. He ends up a, a quintessential example of a false t- a teacher and false prophet in 2 Peter 2. So he can speak true words, but himself, he is worthless. Or again, think of Caiaphas, the high priest, who was Jesus' bitter, sworn enemy. But amazingly, John says that he opened up his wicked mouth and spoke a true prophecy about Jesus, saying it would be better for one man to die and the nation not perish. And then John interpreted the prophecy. By this, he was speaking of Jesus' death, not only for the Jewish nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. But Caiaphas himself was a wicked person and it gained him nothing. So it is with a prophet who has no love. He is nothing. Paul takes this gift even up to the extreme. Not only if a prophet speaks God's words, but even if he can probe the deepest mysteries of the Christian faith. He can fathom all mysteries. He can plumb the depths of the infinite mysteries. Now, the word mystery in the New Testament has to do with something secretly determined in the heart and mind of God as part of redemptive history before the foundation of the world, but then revealed in time. That's how the word mystery is used in the New Testament. And so along comes this prophet who can fathom it right away. He understands exactly what God's doing in all of these New Testament mysteries. And not only that, but he possesses all knowledge, all doctrinal knowledge. He speaks of an individual with the greatest prophetic gift, with with, uh, theological perceptivity to be able to probe the deepest mysteries of the Christian religion, and there's no question that stumps him. Anything you could ask him about Christian doctrine, he can answer. Much like Solomon on issues of wisdom when the Queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. 1 Kings 10.3, it said, Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. Now, such a giftedness would be mind-boggling. To have, have an individual with this level of prophetic gift, you'd think a person like this would be extremely valuable worthy of tremendous reward in heaven. But Paul says, even such an extraordinary person, if he has not love, he is nothing. Now, we want to be a church that knows doctrine. We want to be a a church that knows the deepest mysteries of the faith. We want to be able to have accurate knowledge. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, knowledge puffs up. 
but love edifies or builds up. We, we want knowledge, it's true. We want to learn as much of the Bible doctrine as we possibly can have. It's not a good thing to be doctrinally ignorant. The church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. We want to know the truth. But truth without love is nothing. And then Paul goes beyond that to the gift of faith. Faith without love is nothing. Look at verse 2. If I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. This is the gift of faith now. The gift of faith is something beyond justifying faith. All Christians have faith, but some have the gift of faith. And that's the ability to perceive the hidden things that God is doing And then even to be instrumental in moving the mighty arm of God to do those things that he's going to do, especially by prayer. So the gift of faith exerts itself through prayer. By faith, we're not making God do something contrary to his will. But Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So like Elijah, who we just studied in James chapter 5, was a man of faith in prayer. And God laid it on his heart, the corruption of the Jewish nation, and he laid it on his heart to pray that there would be no rain in fulfillment of the curses of Moses, and there was no rain. And he linked the coming of the going of the rain and the coming back of the rain to a man, a man of faith, a man of prayer. And so we saw this in James 15, 17, 18. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced his crops. So this is great. It's a great gift, the gift of faith. So a man or a woman with a faith that can move mountains would be amazing, an extraordinary gift, an incredible blessing we would think to the church, a mover and shaker in our time, somebody that actually is almost shaping history right before our eyes by his or her amazing prayers. I think about John Knox the great Scottish reformer in the 16th century. He was a fiery man, but also a man of strong faith and who pled in prayer saying, give me Scotland or I'll die. It's kind of passion. He wanted to win his countrymen, fellow Scots, to a genuine faith in the reformed gospel, in the true gospel, away from uh, medieval Catholicism and and its wrong understandings of the gospel. He wanted to win individuals. He's a man of prayer, fiery preacher and fiery man of prayer. But Mary, his lifelong enemy, was Mary, Queen of Scots, and she said, I fear John Knox's prayers more than all the assembled armies of Europe. So talk about a man of great faith and prayer. But Paul says even such a man or a woman of faith exerted in this kind of prayer is nothing if not moved by love. Now we get to verse 3, which I consider one of the toughest verses in the entire Bible. It's really quite remarkable. Talk about being put through the ringer. Look at it. Sacrificial, self-sacrificial generosity, even to the nth degree, even to the farthest degree, is without love is nothing. Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. This is probably the most extraordinary statement of all that we're going to study this morning. The gift of giving pushed to the absolute extreme. Here's an individual who actually does what Jesus urged or commanded the rich young ruler to do. Sell all you possess and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. He wouldn't do it. But this individual, in Paul's statement, verse 3, does do it. He gives everything he possesses to the poor. More than that, that's not enough. He lays down his life as a martyr. And, and not just any martyr, but one who dies an agonizing death in the flames, to be burned at the stake. It's a horrible death. The level of giving here in this verse is almost incalculable. It's, it's almost inconceivable. It's almost immeasurable. Everything this man has on earth, he gives away. But if he has not love while he's doing it, he actually gains nothing. Now, that may be taken one of two ways. The kingdom of heaven is not advanced at all by such a gift, that he gains nothing for Christ, or that he himself on judgment day in terms of rewards will gain nothing. And I think it's more likely the second, that he himself will get nothing for it. Like Jesus says in Matthew 6, I truly, truly, I say to you, you've received your reward in full. You get nothing on judgment day. Do you not feel the weight of this? Very few of us would ever get to this level of self-sacrifice and, self, and self-denial and love. But if you don't have love while you're doing it, then you gain nothing. 
So this past week when we were doing, uh, talking about the doctrine of rewards, I added this as a key plank in understanding what God rewards. You have to have a loving demeanor in your heart, a love in your heart while you do what you do or you gain nothing. Now, it's very important for us to understand, therefore, love is defined both as an action and an attitude. Both sides are important. Not the one without the other, not the other without the one. The Bible makes it very plain that a loving feeling that never results in any actions is worthless too. 1 John 3, 16 through 18 said, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue but with actions and in truth. Well, that's true as well. So love that does not sacrifice and produce actual works actual money given if that's the need, actual uh, service, word, works of service is worthless. Faith without deeds is dead. We understand that. Love inevitably produces actions, and love actually, the, the greatness of love can be measured in the level of sacrifice. The more of a self-denying sacrifice it is, the greater love it is. Jesus said that in John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So true love always results in sacrificial actions. That is true. But 1 Corinthians 13 gives the other side of the equation. There has to be a demeanor, an attitude, a heart of love behind the action, or it's worthless. There's a heart aspect then, an affection, a horizontal delight in the other person. Think about the, the Corinthian, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, the Macedonians, who gave money to the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. You remember that? And Paul talks about their attitude. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. So there it is. There's a heart of affection, a heart of delight in the giving. The Macedonians begged for the opportunity to give. They yearned to be able to give because their hearts were knit together with their brothers and sisters among the Jews in Judea, in Jerusalem. So, therefore, it is possible to give even a ton and do it without love, to do it in an unloving manner. There could be a guilt manipulation side to it, kind of like this. I hope you realize what this has cost me. You do know. I mean, this was a big deal for me, that kind of thing. So there's that, you know, that, that manipulation that, uh, you know, do you understand what the cost was to me? Uh, Proverbs 23, 6 through 8 talks about such a person uh, and gives us some advice. It says, Proverbs 23, 6 through 8, do not eat the food of a stingy man. Do not crave his delicacies, for he's the kind of man who's always thinking about the cost Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little that you have eaten and you will have wasted your compliments. So this is fundamental to love. The person giving has to expand his own heart to take in the person and delight in their blessedness through the giving. That's what Paul means by love. Jonathan Edwards said this, in some sense, the most benevolent, generous person in the world seeks his own happiness in doing good to others because he places his happiness in their good. His mind is so enlarged as to take them, as it were, into himself. Thus, when they are happy, he feels it. He partakes with them. He's happy in their happiness. This is so far from being inconsistent with the freeness of love that, on the contrary, free benevolence and kindness consists in it. This is what love actually is. Your heart expands to someone suffering or somebody going through something, and you want to take them in and make them blessed, make them happy. Now, I, I believe a lot of Christian teaching that I've heard in my life is against this. I've heard again and again love is an action. It's an action. It's not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Christian love is not a feeling. It's an action. You've heard that, and I know it's, it's leaning so heavily on 1 John 3 that I just read. But what I'm saying is, no, no, that's not true. Christian, Christian love is an action and a feeling. It's a feeling or a sense in the heart that leads to action. And without the one, it's worthless. That's the very point that Paul's making here in verse 3. Uh, John Piper makes much of this in his book, Knowing God, in his chapter on love. I know some of you have read it, and you remember that phrase, dutiful roses. Remember that? Where, where the husband says to his wife, he said, I want you to know, um, 
I get nothing out of this. We're told that this is Christian love, is what we call disinterested benevolence. I get nothing out of it. I just want you to realize, I get nothing out of this. I, I've, I've read on the calendar that it, today is our anniversary. And in our culture, there is the giving of roses on anniversary. So I am hereby giving you 12 roses in fulfillment of the rules of our culture. I want you to know I feel nothing, no personal delight out of this giving. Here you are, happy anniversary. I mean, who wants roses like that? Honey, if you, if you don't enjoy giving them, then don't give them. You need to expand your heart and say, I'm happy because you're happy. And the roses are a means to that end. So 1 Corinthians 13 implies our hearts must be engaged. They need to be delighted. Like Jesus died on the cross for the joy that was set before him because he wanted to expand his heart and include wretched, miserable sinners like you and me. And so there was a joy even in the sorrow of giving up his body on the cross. That's what love is. So as we look at this, we think, how could this even happen? How could love to this nth degree be done without, without, or how could gifts to this nth degree be done without love? How could someone speak in the tongues of men and of angels without love? Well, there's no horizontal expansion. It doesn't take uh, his brothers and sisters in and say, I want you to be blessed by this. Uh, how does someone have the gift of prophecy and an ability to fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and have not love? Well, it's all about him. It's all about his, his exquisite knowledge. His heart isn't enlarged or expanded to take in others and say, I want you to be blessed by the truths of God's word. How does someone give all they possess to the poor and surrender his body to the flames but have not love? His heart's not expanded to include them in the sacrifice. That's what it is. Fundamentally, then, love is a heart disposition, an attraction in the heart toward another human being or a group of human beings so that our blessedness is included in their blessedness. We want them to be blessed, and so we give. And it's described in the words that will follow. We'll study, God willing, over the next few weeks. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not easily angered. It's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it keeps no record of wrongs. These things we're going to walk through. If that's who you are while you do your spiritual gift ministry, then you will be blessed. So, applications. First and foremost, I'm very aware that God in his kind providence brings all different kinds of people to this live stream to hear this. And I want to speak first and foremost to you who, who are not yet a Christian. If I could just say, before anything else can happen, before you can genuinely love, you need to be loved by God through Jesus Christ. We love because he first loved us. And so God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And so I plead with you, repent of your sins. Repent of all of your lovelessness. All sin is lovelessness. Repent of the ways you've been selfish and the way that you've fed your flesh and the way you've not loved others. All of these things are sins more than we could count. David said, my sins are more numerous than the hairs of my head. All of them are atoned for in an ocean of God's grace and love through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. So repent of your sins, trust in Christ, and then see what God will do. He will take out your heart of stone and he will give you a heart of love. And out of that heart of love, you will be able finally to love others as the Lord has loved you. Now, if you are a Christian, I just wanna say, let 1 Corinthians 13, first and foremost, be hard on you. Let it work you over. Let it put you through the ringer. Let it show you the ways that you have not been loving. Let, us, let it show you the lovelessness in your life. And, and then let it, let it move you to prayer. Say, Lord, as I see this pattern of lovelessness in me, as I see this happening, would you please transform me? Would you please work in me a genuine heart of love for others, a genuine heart of love for my wife or my husband, for my kids, a genuine heart of love for my brothers or my sisters, a genuine heart of love for other church members? Work this in me. Go through each element of 1 Corinthians 13 and pray it back to God. And then finally, be hopeful. Like I said, I don't want it to be crushing you, but I don't, I don't want it to be too light on you either. So that it not crush you, I want you to know, if you're a genuine Christian, if you're born again, someday these words will be perfectly fulfilled in you. Heaven is a world of love, and you will spend all eternity loving your brothers and sisters perfectly as the Lord Jesus has loved you. Close with me in prayer. Father, thank you for the time that we've had to study your wonderful word. I'm delighted in it, even though it's hard. 1 Corinthians 13, 3, one of the hardest verses I've ever meditated on. 
But Lord, I want to have that level of self-denying sacrifice in my life. I want to have that kind of love in my life. And I want my brothers and sisters who are hearing me to to be willing to to deny ourselves and, and to give as much of ourselves and our money as we can, but to do it with a heart of love in the pattern of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this time, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this resource from twojourneys.org. Feel free to use and share this content to spread the knowledge of God and build His kingdom. Only we ask that you do so for non-commercial purposes and in accordance with the copyright policy found at twojourneys.org. Two Journeys exists to help Christians make progress in the two journeys of the Christian life, the internal journey of sanctification, and the external journey of gospel advancement. We do this by exporting biblical teaching for the good of Christ's church and for the glory of God.